Mike, could you, uh, can I have a cup of coffee? The way I like it? Yes. <laughs> uh, hey, man, just dump that creamer in there, buddy. Just dump it. Huh? <laughs> no, you cannot have it. <laughs> Anybody want my notes on the cities of refuge? Cities of refuge. She's my new fitness one day. You never know. I mean, it's just. Okay. Three, two, one. You don't have to have one. I'm just going to chuck them. You know how you clean up your Bible every now and then? You know, you get filled with. We don't do bulletins here. I mean, back in, back in, in the day. All right. I'm for coffee. We're going to be in Isaiah 6. We're going to be in 1 Samuel 3 today. And we're going to be in um, 2 Corinthians. Hey, Isaiah or Corinthians? Yes. <laughs> Which one first? Uh, we'll, be, we'll be in probably 1 Samuel first, then Isaiah, and then 2 Corinthians. Stop. Did you put sugar in it? Did you dump it? Mm. Oh, that's good coffee, Steve. That's good cream on my coffee. Just drink the creamer. Okay, first Samuel chapter three. Three. That's a brand drink too with like half creamer and about seven sugars. Okay, now oh you're on your phone. Um Actually, I, I do. I do want to review a little bit, so that means we got to go back to Revelation chapter four for a minute. That's all right. Just put bookmarks in there. You got time? I got paper. I can rip up for you. That's right. Who needs those anyway? All right. So let's start in Revelation chapter four as we rethink for the, well, the last three sermons. That we went over. I'm not going to re-preach them, but I just want to rethink them very quickly. Uh, the very first sermon was, I don't want you to serve Christ, and Christ doesn't want you to serve him either. In a way that um, you come to Christ uh, in, as a servant uh, so that your status with him, so that his love for you might be shored up, or so that your confidence in his love for you might be established. Don't serve Christ like that. He doesn't need your service in that way. Why? Because he came to serve you. And we look at Mark 10, verse, uh, I think it's, I don't remember what verse, I think it's 45, where he says, um, the greatest in the kingdom will be servant to all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came not to be served, but to what? To serve. He came to serve you in order to establish a reconciliation with the Father. You are completely in Christ, reconciled to God. That means God no longer has a beef with you anymore. Not one ounce of a beef. Not one little problem with you at all if you are in Christ. Why? Because Jesus has borne all of our sins in his body on the tree by his act of service on the cross. Does that make sense? And so if, if every beef that God had with you was taken care of by Jesus on the cross, then what's left? What, what's he mad at anymore? What's God going to pour out his wrath on anymore? He is completely satisfied, I love that word, quenched, fulfilled every ounce of wrath that you deserved 
in your sin by what Jesus did in serving you on the cross. So no longer do we have to try to work really hard to gain God's approval, to gain God's acceptance, or to even feel confident in his acceptance of us. It's kind of like this. I, um, uh, Y'all know Mike Sandusky. Uh, some of you might know him. He's a pastor out of Living Hope in uh, St. Joe. And uh, he's got a rental property here. And he asked me, hey, could you go over and look at the shower? There's no hot water coming out of the, <laughs> the hot water faucet. <laughs> so I get there, you know, and uh, I get there and the guy shows me. He says, yeah, here's the hot water. And he points to the cold faucet, which evidently somebody had, you know, the little H and the little C's, you know, the little cats. Somebody had swapped them. Whoever the prior renters were or whatever, I, I don't know what happened. Or when somebody worked on it, they just put them on and didn't pay attention. Well, anyway, he says, there's the hot water sinking, and he turned it on, and it's completely cold. We let it, I'm like, well, the hot water's usually on the left. Let's give that one a go. And, <laughs> and, and I was there all of five minutes, and I, and, I, and I called Mike, and I said, hey, Mike, there's no problem with the hot water. Uh, he's like, well, well, how much do I owe you? I'm like, Mike, I'm not going to charge you for this. This was, this was no problem. And he sat for a minute or two, like, no, I'm going to send you something. No, I'm going to send you something. And I'm like, no, you're not. It's, it's, it's not a big deal. I was on my way to do something else. It was on the way. No problem. I said, I don't want you to have this debtor. There's a certain sense in which he felt indebted to me. And he felt like he needed to pay back this gift. Like, I can't receive the gift. Unless I just give you a little something for it, then I'll feel better about receiving the gift. And that's kind of the way we approach God. God is offering a free gift. He's done all the work. He's done, done everything needed so that you might be reconciled with God. And we accept the gift, but we've got a little guilty feeling about it. We're like, especially the time, we, we especially feel guilty in the times where we have to access that grace of fresh and new. Because how many times, how many of your sins did Jesus die for? All of them. So, does God know every sin you're going to commit? Yes. He does. He does, indeed. But why is it we feel bad about receiving God's grace in the moments of our sin in the present tense? Do you know what I'm saying? We're, in, in other words, we're like, man, i got to go to God and need some new mercy because I just... And you forget the fact that Jesus died for that sin, too. And so we kind of feel like... We feel like His love is... Uh, this can happen. It doesn't always happen to everybody. And I hope it never doesn't happen to you anymore. If it did, it used to happen to me. But basically, we feel like God's love for us is now in question in the present tense because I'm not walking in obedience right now or in that moment. I didn't, or whatever I'm feeling guilty of, whatever the Holy Spirit's convicted me of, uh, I'm not feeling secure in God's love for me. So how do you reestablish that security? Well, many people go about different ways. That Some people go to confession to a priest. And, you know, oh, I confessed it, now I feel okay again, you know. Or maybe they go to confession themselves in prayer, which is fine. Or or maybe they like, man, i gotta, I got to really get over this sin, this habit that I've been in. And as long as, man, if I can just have a period where I don't do that anymore, I can feel reestablished in God's love for me. If I can just get over this thing, now God can love me again. And we don't articulate it that way, but do you not live it out that way? Do you not experience the emotions of rest? the emotions of confidence before God in those times where you obey Him and you don't feel as confident when you disobey Him. And that's probably natural and normal. And I don't want you to ever feel confident in sin. I just don't want you to feel unconfident. Is that the word? Unconfident? Is that a word? Unsure. Unsure of God's love in those moments of failure. God's love hasn't changed. It's been steadfast and sure. And His love has never been rooted or grounded in your obedience it's always been rooted and grounded in Jesus' obedience on your behalf. So that's what I'm saying. Don't serve Christ so that you can reestablish or shore up God's love for you as a true and faithful one. But rather, He is the true and faithful one who came to serve you so that you might rest in His righteousness. And rest in His righteousness that is yours. I will stand before God one day and He will say to me, Jim Pierce, well done, good and faithful servant. He will. I will enter into the joy of his reward with, with exceeding joy, the Bible say, says. He will declare me faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's June 24. Uh, I will be blameless and holy before him, uh, but not, not one ounce having to do with anything I've ever done. Not one deed, not one act. The only act or deed 
If you want to call it a work, it is the work of believing on his son. This is the work of God that you believe on the one whom he sent. John 6.18, I think. So that was sermon number one. Don't serve Jesus that way. He doesn't want your service. So that your his love for you might be shored up or established or increased or any other thing. He came to serve you. Secondly, I said, but be careful as you engage in service for Christ. Be careful how you do that. And I spent the last two weeks talking about this. The heart of the servant. Um, Jesus will not, Jesus is going to be the exalted one. He's going to be the glorified one. So he won't share his glory with anybody. And there's sometimes in our hearts, uh, we've come to Christ, we know him, we're saved, we're on our way to heaven. But then we set about serving Christ, and then we feel the um, we feel the joy of service for Christ, but it gets misplaced in our own pride, and it gets misplaced in our own self exaltation, uh, and that happens any number of ways. Here's a way that I've seen it in college students, and not necessarily in y'all, but I've seen it in college students. Um, it becomes a, uh, like in the NADS or in crew or whatever, it becomes a status thing. If you love Jesus and you serve him well, you, be, you there's, a, there's a, do you see that too? I mean, is, that a, is that something you might have seen? Um, I saw it in my own youth group growing up, that those who were respected in the youth group, those that were looked up to, they walk with Christ. And so we, we, we pursue a walk with Christ so that we might have status among our group. You see, and that's dangerous because all of a sudden Jesus is the means to have status in the world. Isn't that what we're all seeking? Isn't that what we? And that's what I said. We all seek success. We all want status. We all want. We all want to be somebody in the world, even if it's the, the greatest servant of Christ. You know, and, and, and remember those words: He that would be great among you will be servant to all. And remember what I said last week: He's not giving you the formula for greatness in the kingdom. No, that's. Let me say it this way. He's not giving you the formula by which you pursue greatness in the kingdom. In other words, um, we, we're not going to use Jesus like James and John. We're trying to use Jesus to get status in the kingdom. Hey, Jesus, when you're exalted to your throne, can I sit on your right hand or on your left? They were serving Jesus. They were with Jesus. They were following Jesus. They were obeying his commands. But what was their heart? Their heart was pursuing greatness. Not the exaltation of the great one, but rather they wanted to use the exaltation of the great one as their own. We have to be careful that that's not in any way, shape, or form in our hearts. And so we have to be careful that, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, you, you feel that on Facebook. Um, you want to share Christ uh, or you want to share some profound thought. What do you want when you, when you share a profound thought on Facebook? Or when you put a post on Facebook at all, what do you want? Come on, tell me. Likes. You, want it, you want it liked. That like button is so dangerous. You know what I'm saying? Because you want people to see what you said, see what you posted, and you want people to say, I like it. That feels good. I got a hundred likes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's human. And that's in and of itself maybe not so wrong. But here's the thing. How do we do that in the Christian walk? You know, I preach and, and, and 30 people said they liked my sermon. It's not wrong to say. But I, can't, I have to be careful personally that I'm not going for that like button in, from a sermon. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going for one like button. <laughs> you know what I mean? God's approval. And that's the danger of serving Christ. That is the danger that we don't use Jesus as a way that we might increase self-esteem, self-worth, self-success, whatever you want to say self. You have to be careful about that. And I, I told you we would be in the scriptures in Revelation 4. I want you to see something that God does indeed promise us that we're going to have a place by his side. You know, James and John didn't really need to ask Jesus, hey, I want to be on your right and on your left hand, because we're going to be there on his right hand. You, we get to be there on the right, around the throne of Christ. And here's a wonderful picture in Revelation 4, where he says, After this I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven in the first voice, uh, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here and I'll show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and with one seat on the throne. And he who sat on that throne had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. So you got one big throne and 24 thrones around it. 
Okay, that's seated around it. That's next to it, beside it. You know, that's with this throne. And there are 24 elders seated on that throne. And they were clothed in white garments, and golden crowns were on their heads. Let me just tell you, that's you. That's a picture that 24 thrones are believers, not just 24 special ones, but rather it's just a symbol of we who are ruling and reigning with Christ in heaven. We're clothed in white garments. What do you think that represents? Huh? Purity and righteousness. And we have the righteousness of the one righteous one. And we're, but we are ruling and reigning with him. And what are we wearing on our heads, he says? Verse 4, with golden crowns on their heads. Now from the throne came flashes of lightning, verse 5, and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God before the throne. This is a vision John is seeing, but it means something. It, this thunder is, a, is an example of this power and authority that is Christ, and is coming from the one throne. The first living creature, like a lion, there was a living creature full of eyes in the front and the back. I'm, I'm going fast here. Verse 8, and the four living creatures, each one of them six wings full of eyes around and within. Day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And remember what holy means. It doesn't just mean perfect and good and righteous, though it does mean that. It means there's none like it. He's altogether unique. He's altogether set apart and wholly different, W-H-O-L-M-Y, uh, different than any other of his creation. He's set apart and unique, and that set apartness and unique him, uniqueness makes him worthy of exaltation by the ones who are not like him. That's what holy means as you get your mind around it. So they're declaring his holiness, and they never stop saying it. That is the, that is the background music of heaven. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, verse 9 says, and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, what do they do? They fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, because you created all things, and by your will they are and were Created. What's the point I'm making with this text? You see that the 24 elders, they've got status with Christ. They are ruling and reigning with Christ. They have received the glorious inheritance of the saints with Christ. But in heaven, the great one in the kingdom is one. Because what do we do with our glory, with our exaltation with Christ? We bow the knee and we throw our crowns at his feet. What's that crown? It's a crown of authority. And so if I'm taking a crown of authority and throwing it down on the ground before the one authoritative one, what am I saying? Yes, I am the king with you, but you are the king of kings. In other words, you are the real king. You are the exalted king. That's what Romans 8, 29 and 30 said. For whom he foreknew, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. We're going to be like Christ. We're going to be conformed to his image so that Jesus might be the firstborn the preeminent one, the firstborn, the one who gets it all, the firstborn among many brothers like him. In other words, I'm, if Jesus is the Son of God, and I'm the Son of God, what's that make me and Jesus? Brothers. We have the same Father. That means we're brothers, and we're exalted sons with Christ, but Jesus is the exalted one. And that's the point. When we think of service in the kingdom, serving Christ and serving God, as I want you all to do, we have to understand that service to Christ is all about Christ. It is not about us. And that's what I preached last week. And there I re-preached the sermon. And I said I wouldn't. I wasn't lying. I just couldn't, couldn't stop the, the urge. But aren't you glad you just heard two sermons? And the, Yeah, of course you are. <laughs> Unconfidence of word. I just thought I'd let you know. What's that? When you said unconfident. Unconfident. Oh, it is a word. Yeah. Well, I, I just sometimes. Does that ever Confident and hesitant is what yeah. it is. I just had to tell you that for you. Thank you. Sorry. No, no it's fine. So we need to work on. We need to work on purging our motives. And, and, and I really, really want you to uh, think that through. Now, maybe this is the time. I said I was going to be in Samuel. 
First Samuel first. Well, let's go to Second Corinthians twelve first, because after we preaching that, this is a better place for it. Second Corinthians twelve. Now, this is new material, new stuff. So, what we want to do now is is start looking at people whom God has used. Be careful. This is a draw. Don't you want to be used by God? The hard question is why do you want to be used by God? That's the deep searching question. Why? Because he's worthy of you. Of you. In other words, he's worthy. You're not. Uh, you're his servant. We did look at Luke. Um, is it Luke 17? Matthew 17? I think it's Matthew 17. Remember, we don't come in and we say to our masters, hey, I did all my work all day. Now you need to. I'm going to sit down and you need to serve me. No, we, we serve the master and we say we're just unworthy servants doing what is. is. So that's the mindset that Jesus teaches us to serve God. Is, is The mindset is we're unworthy servants and he is the worthy one. Now, aren't you glad that God knows your heart? Now, the reason is because you don't even know your own heart, do you? There are hidden folds of pride and, and self in your heart that you don't even know. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So when I say, hey, purify your hearts and, and search your motives, you can only go so far. But God searches the heart. He sees every little inner, inner curve in the heart. Yet who does God use as servants? He uses people, unworthy people. But God knowing the heart does what it takes to make you usable. So I'm gonna I'm I'm saying to you, I want you in prayer to start saying, God, I'm, I'm an unworthy servant, and I just want you to, to use me. I you have my body, I am yours. I give myself to you so that you might own me and command me, and I'll do all your will. That's what I live for. That's what I want you to start praying and thinking about. But as you do that, Begin asking God, too, to purify your heart because only you, you can see so deeply. And I see in Paul here an example of that very thing. Verse 12. I must go on boasting. What? <laughs> Did I say verse 12? Chapter 12, verse 1. Sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. I must go on boasting. Though there's nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. What Paul is doing is he is right now in the context of 2 Corinthians, he is um, uh, he's defending his ministry is what he's basically doing. He's received some false attacks uh, by some, the super apostles, he calls them sarcastically in chapter 11. And he just starts saying, uh, listen, my ministry is not to be questioned. And, and here's the proof. And he just goes down all the list of what he's done. He says in verse 30, If I boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and the Father of Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. He's really making a case uh, to the Corinthians. You need to stop listening to these guys who are defaming my name. And, so, and he knows, by the way, it's foolish what he's doing. Look at chapter 11, verse 1. I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. Do bear with me. In other words, he knows what he's about to say is not really a good thing to say, but he's going to say it anyway because he's overwhelmed emotionally and he's sharing it. So chapter 12, verse 1. So I'm going to go on boasting, he says. So there's nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in body or out of the body, I do not know. Now, the man he knows, by the way, is himself. He's referring to his own conversion. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told. Uh, which which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weakness. You see how he is distancing himself from the old man and speaking of uh, who he is now? Because who was the old man? Saul. Paul used to be Saul. And he was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew of Hebrews, born from the tribe of Benjamin. And he knew the law. And he was a, he was, Zealous for God, but in a wrong way. What did God do? Remember on the road to Damascus? What was he on the road to Damascus doing? Huh? 
He blinded him, yeah. He's going, he's going to Damascus to kill Christians. Jesus appears to, to Paul and blinds him and says, you're not Paul anymore. You're Saul. You've been, you've been persecuting me. You're going to stop it now. Paul had no choice in the matter. And God, Jesus transformed him immediately like that. That's the man he's talking about. He said, that man. On behalf of this man, I will boast. Though, verse 6. Though, if I should wish to boast, I would, I would be, not be a fool. I think he's speaking humanly. For I'm speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being what? Conceited or exalted. Paul didn't want this thorn because three times he pleaded that the Lord, uh, with the Lord about this, that it should leave him. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then am I strong. What's he saying? Paul knows that if not, uh, excuse me, God knows that if he doesn't keep Paul in check, Paul's head is going to explode with pride. God had a plan for Paul. God had a plan to use Paul in mighty ways. And in that using of Paul, God was revealing things to him uh, that were magnitude and great, that Paul, if he wasn't kept in check, he could go around boasting, I've heard from God, that makes me special. Though he might not have declared such things, he would have felt it. And how would that feel? What would that do to Paul inside? It would puff him up. And Paul would somehow share in God's glory, right? He would somehow think that the thing that God was doing, he was all, it was him. And here's the thing. God says, I ain't going to let that happen. God knows your hearts, and he knows my heart, and he knows what you and I need to keep us from that very thing. So one of the principles I want to teach you this morning, as we think about serving Christ, as much as in us, we need to purge our own conceited and selfish and prideful ambitions with God so that we might not be exalted in the ministry or exalted in what we try to do on God's behalf or for God. Rather... We need to realize that everything we do is because we want Christ to be exalted. That means, uh, to, to quote, uh, uh, to quote, uh, what's the what's the Christian rapper's name? Huh? Yeah, I could play the back because I know I'll just get in the way. I'll play the back um, or is it Toby Mac? He sang the song "You Take the Lead" or something. Like that. Yeah, is that that's a Toby Mac song? Uh, but they're, 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 these are guys who are being exalted by people. Man, I love that music. And people are yelling and singing like a concert, exalting them. And they're saying, I don't want this exaltation. Of, and all that's in me, I want the exaltation of Christ. But what is the human condition? What is the problem with humans? We love our exaltation. We do. We crave it. We desire it. We want it. And it is so dangerous. And God knows it. God knows it. So here's, here's a principle I just want you to see that as you begin to purge your own heart of, of those in, hidden folds of pride in your heart, do that and do it as hard as you can to know this. You've got a God who knows the hidden fold. And you just pray and you say, God, you do whatever you've got to do to make me usable. This is a prayer I pray often. Pray, I pray very often. God, I need to be usable. I want to be usable. And I need to be usable in such a way that you only get the glory. Because that's my heart. Because I know me. I know me. I want glory. I want exaltation. I want your like buttons in life. You know, I want that stuff. And that's in me. And I know it. But my spirit within me is saying, but I want Jesus to receive all the likes. I want him to get all the glory and, and all the honor. And so we need to make sure that as much as in us, that we are purging ourselves of our own pride. But know this, we have a God who loves to use usable people. And what are usable people here in this text? Weak people. Weak people. Now that brings me to the next point. We have to be careful with the gifts that God's given to us. 
we must not ever think. Now, there's two ways you can look at this. And I want, to, I want to preach to both ways. There are two ways you can look for serving God. You might say to yourself, and yet and you must be careful, you who have many talents, you who have many abilities, you who things come naturally to. Um, people say to me, Jim, you know the Bible really well. To be honest with you, it comes naturally. I don't work hard at it at all. I can't boast in this, okay? And so I don't want to ever take any credit for that. That's just the Lord who said, yeah, I'm going to give you a gift. But I should never, ever use that gift and think and think to myself, yeah, I got some talent. You've seen it right. You know, we've got to be careful. I don't, who would ever say that? But that's going on in the back of the mind. Even in my conscious mind, I don't say that. But man, that's really going on even behind my conscious mind. We've got to be careful. But that being said, uh, whatever gifts you might have, we don't say, yes, I've got all this talent. God should really use me. That's not the way God has worked throughout the ages. In fact, if God, uh, if God has used anybody through the ages, it's the person who, when you look at them, there's not much to them. There's not a whole lot to applaud, humanly speaking. There's not a whole lot to exalt, humanly speaking. But why does God do it that way and not the other? Why? Because God just goes about, listen, can God use a rock if he wants to? He sure can. So, I mean, listen, he can use a trash can. He can use he can use anything he wants to to get as much glory as he wants to, right? He can do it. But when he does it, he wants to make sure he gets it all. He gets all the glory. What is, what is it, what's the refrain of the Old Testament prophets? I will not give my glory to anyone. This is what God, that's the refrain of the Old Testament prophets. You have defamed my name and I will not give my glory to another. That's, when you read the prophets, that's what you take away. You've defamed me. You've deglorified me. You've profaned my name. You've treated me as if I'm something to be dragged through the mud. And my glory is at stake. And I'm not giving my glory to anybody. I don't share my glory with anyone. And so, if God doesn't share his glory with anyone, who's he going to choose to use? One who can't glory in anything. Does that make sense? Because when God works in a person, it is all Him. And it is none of us. None of you. What do you have that you have not received? Think about it. You've got knowledge? Where did you get it? Did you come up with it? Did you make your brain that functions the way it does? You did not. God gave you the brain you had. The talent on the drums, which we enjoy, God gave you that. You can't ever boast. And that's the mindset. A wife sings well. She can't boast. Anything you see in yourself that's good, God is working that for you. You can't take credit. And that is a principle that's going to keep you humble. You must realize, you must have this mind in you all the time that you don't have anything that God has not given you. What do you have that you have not received? And if you have received it, why do you boast, Paul says, as if you haven't received it? Do you get, it? Do you get that? That's, that's important. Hugely important. So we must not think, ah, I'm, I'm usable. Because I have all this talent. I have all this ability. I have all this knowledge. I have all this you fill in the blank. I am usable. God, you should use me. God doesn't need your talents. Can he use your talents? Yes. And a humble man, he will use them. And a humble woman, he will use them. But he doesn't need them. He doesn't. But there's the opposite truth. It's also true. This is a, a, a certain type of humility that um, I think it's false humility, and I want to be careful here. I don't want to be unkind to you, but I want you to stop it as well. I don't have really any talents. I don't really have any abilities. I don't, I'm not really good at much. God can't use me. Do you know what you just said about God? <laughs> and God is incapable of taking you who don't have much to offer and give you something to offer the world? No, come on. God can do anything. God is not inhibited by your lack of knowledge. Who made your mind? And if he wants to give you knowledge, he'll give it to you. And that's what he did to Paul, did he not? He gave Paul knowledge that he didn't give other people. So that through one man, we might have the knowledge that God gave him. You see? 
say, well, I can't play an instrument. Okay? It doesn't, that doesn't mean you join a band. I can't play an instrument. I'm going to beat this. <laughs> or watch a veggie tale. He's, he's beating, beating a piece of wood. <laughs> the best wood block player of all, you know? It's, it was called, uh, what was it called? Uh, fever. What was it? Um, <laughs> what's that? Saturday Night Fever. What, but it was called uh, celery, uh, cucumber fever. I can't remember what it was. But it was, it was <laughs> what is it? No, it wasn't funky fever. No, no, no. Anyway, it was silly. Uh, it, it was quite silly, but uh, <laughs> he played the woodblock. <laughs> and he took pride in it, man. <laughs> he, he had some greatest hits, Knock on Wood. Uh, <laughs> 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 it was funny. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm talking about veggie tales and what's wrong. What am I, what am I mean? What am I mean? You must never think you have nothing to offer God. Uh, in other words, you should never use the fact that you believe you have nothing to offer God as a reason why you're excluded from usability from God by God. In other, didn't Moses try to do that? God says, I've chosen you, Moses. You're going to Pharaoh. What does Moses say? I don't talk well, God. I can't. I, I, I don't talk good. I can't talk to the talk good. <laughs> I don't talk good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, God says, who made your tongue? I'll put my words in there. Yeah. Uh, point is that Moses didn't have much to offer in his opinion. That's probably why God chose Moses. Because he didn't have much to offer. I think before God can use us as his vessels, we need to be empty. And part of life is God emptying us of self. Another principle I want you to So let me just re recap the principles I've shown you. As we give ourselves, as we come to God giving ourselves to Him to be used, we say, God, you have my body, you may do whatever you want. And I want you to be praying that. I want you to be thinking that, God, you owned me, you can do whatever you want with me. That should be a massive part of your prayer life. God will honor that prayer, even if you don't know what that means. As a 17 year old, I had no idea what that meant. I prayed for the first time God, you have me, you own me. And I just began praying, I want to know you, I want to understand you. And he sent me Proverbs chapter 2, verse 3, and it says, yeah, if you cry out for knowledge, if you lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hid treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And I have been on that trail ever since I prayed that. But I had no idea what I was asking for when I was 17 years old praying that. And you may not be, and whatever age you are now, you may not know what that means. When you say, God, you own me, you can do whatever. I want to do your will. I want to be your servant. You ought to be praying these things, but and you may not know what that means. But start praying from the reality of your heart. And start praying a second year for God, make me usable. I know that there's a lot of in me that, um, you know, there's sin in me. I need you to, and, and, and you ask God to deal with in your heart. And, and there's pride, and there's, there's self-focused -fo motives. There's all kinds of self in you. And you just start praying, God, I want you to get all the glory. I want you to get all the glory. And that needs to be your mindset. And know this, know this, that whatever you can't see and destroy, he can. And it might be through a thorn in the flesh. Though. I've got one. I've got a thorn in the flesh, and I kind of know what it is. And I know why God's given it to me. And I know, um, I, I kind of know what's going on. But um, I'll gladly boast in that so that I can be usable. Uh, not boast like to your I've got a thorn in the flesh. That so makes me. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just like Paul. Well, you know, I'm just I was like, here, have another. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's not what I'm saying. But that's not what Paul's saying either. He's not boasting in his weakness. He just looks at a weakness that you might get upset about, depressed about, angry about. He says, no, that's a good thing because it, lets, it, it, it puts me in a place where God can actually use me and I'm actually usable. So I want you to begin praying for usability. But stop using this as an excuse. Why well, don't I have much to offer God? Why well, would he want with me? You're the person he really wants. But it's the person who comes to God and says, God, you should really use me because i got a lot to offer you. That's not the guy God wants. Why? Because that is too much potential for him to share in that glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, we preach Christ, verse 5, and we're just servants for, for your sakes. For God who said, let there be light, he's now shining in our hearts. God's the one shining in our hearts to give the light and the knowledge of the glory of God. The glory of God is being shown in my heart, he says, in the face of Jesus. 
And then he goes on to say, and this is my treasure in earthen vessels, in jars of clay. This is my treasure. This is what I get. This is a valuable thing so that God can get all the glory. This is about my value that God gets glory. And I'm nothing. I'm just a jar of clay. I'm an earthen vessel. I'm a dirt pot. I'm a cracked pot. He goes on to say, this is our treasure, jars of clay, so that the excellencies may be of him, not of us. God does it this way so that he gets all the glory. And we don't. You want to be used of God? Why do you want to be used of God? The answer should be because he deserves honor out of my life. That's the only answer to give. He deserves glory. And I want him to be glorified above all things. He must increase. I must decrease. I wasn't planning to go here, but I'm feeling glad to do that, so let's do it. Uh, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, Samuel, Isaiah, I'll get to you next week. <laughs> I might get to him in a minute if I can finish. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. I keep saying, the past three weeks I'm going to get to Isaiah and Samuel, and I just haven't done it yet. Is that okay? Huh? Verse 14. 2 Timothy 2 14. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the ears. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So Paul is saying, Listen, Timothy, I want you to present yourself to God. But as an approved worker, if John, I'm going to use John's illustration, if I send John off to do a job, and I say, hey, John, go do this job, I'll, I'll check up on you later. And I come, and he says, here, come look at the work that I've done. And it's shoddy, it's bad, it's, that's not something he's going to, he's not going to stand in that moment proud, because I'm going to look at that and see see the inadequacies of the job, and, and, and he's not going to take, he shouldn't be taking pride in such in that kind of work. But man, if he does a, a great job, and he does his best in, in every aspect of it, and I look, he can stand there not unashamed of what he's done. You see, that's the way Paul's talking. We need to present our bodies unto him, but what kind of body are you presenting to God? What kind of what kind of service are you offering? Well, God, I, I'll do this and that, but really, I'm just going to go live in sin and love it and do this thing. And, I, and, and this is what I got to offer you, you know. Um, you know, sometimes kids will uh, like. <laughs> sometimes kids will go off and they want to draw you a picture, and from that picture, they want you to look at that picture and feel loved. And you want to look at that picture, and they want you to like what they've drawn. But you know, they took them about two seconds with one pencil, because they just drew a happy face and a smile and sticks all over, you know. And, th and they give that to you as a little kid. And what they're doing is they're, they're wanting your approval. They want you to your satis they're presenting it to you to be satisfied by you, to love them in, in response to what you've given. And uh, often what often when a parent looks at the, that kind of work, you're not thinking, man, I'm so impressed with all the time and the effort you just put, the 30 seconds you just put in and do it, you know. Uh, you don't say that to your child. You, what do you tell them? <laughs> oh, wonderful! You Google and on, you work it up inside, but you're not really feeling it. God's not going to do that. We have to be careful what we're offering God as servants. We say, God, you can have me. For uh, uh, what kind? What are we offering Him for service? Now, this is where we have to be careful. The gospel has to be preached right next to that message because you got to be careful. Uh, I, I'm not preaching unless it says work really hard so you can have God's approval. But you don't rest in God's approval to such a degree that you just go off and live in sin and love it. And you say, well, well God, you love me anyway. I can just live in sin and hear my service for you. That would be unacceptable. In other words, when God is working in you and through you, you will not give him your seconds. You will not give him your leftovers. In fact, I used to preach a message. It was called, God doesn't want your leftovers. <laughs> God does, And I think I preached it here early on. God doesn't want your leftovers. He doesn't want my leftovers. He wants... My best. And so Paul's telling Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God. What does it mean? What do you see when you hear present yourself to God? How does that what does that look like in life? If I were to come to you and say, maybe I show up at your house. Uh, maybe I go to Steve's house. Steve, I picked up you for a while. And I, I say, Steve, you know, I'm here to uh, 
I'm here to do yard work for you, or I'm here to you know, do this or that. And then, and then um, I, I sit on a lawn chair, and I drink lemonade, which you've made and given to me. And I, I spend several hours just relaxing and chilling. I have said with my mouth, I'm here to serve you, and yet what do I do? I do nothing. Now, it's one thing to say to God, God, here I am, use me. And then what do you do when you go off and, and, and live life? See, be careful that your prayer life isn't, isn't uh, God, here I am, and then your life life, you know, what you actually live out, isn't, is God, I, I, I'm too busy, or God, I really don't want to do that thing or this thing. In other words, our, our, our lives, giving ourselves over to God isn't just part of our prayer, but it begins with prayer. Secondly, it's gotta be, there's got to be the follow-through in, in, in the day, in, in our life. As we begin living, we need to be thinking, well, what does God want me to do here in this situation or that situation? What does his word say about what, where I am in life and how I need to be? How do I need to be spending my money? How should I be working? How should I be serving others and serving him? And so do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Now, in this situation, Paul is speaking specifically in verse 15 about rightly handling the word of God. So and me as a Bible teacher, one of the ways I give myself over to the Lord as a, an approved worker, as, a, as opposed to an ashamed worker, is I handle the Word of God properly. I preach the Word of God well. You have too many preachers who don't, who don't interpret the Scriptures well, who use the Bible as just their source to prove the things that they want to say. They'll take the Scriptures out of context. They don't understand the context. They don't know it. They just find verses in which they like the words. They pull them out of a context. They go, they go and uh, pre preach whatever they want to preach, and then they sprinkle a Scripture here and there. This is, this is the methodology of, pop, of popular TV preachers. And basically, what they're doing is they're not handling the Word of God properly, and when they stand before God, they will be ashamed. They will be ashamed. They will also hear depart from them. So Paul is saying to Timothy, don't be like that. He's also saying avoid the reverent babble, or it'll lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus are examples of those who have swerved from the truth, saying the resurrection has already happened, and they're upsetting the faith of some. But God's here it is, verse 19, God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. God seals his foundation and, and those standing on the foundation of God. His, here's the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Listen, he knows. Uh, he, if you're his, he knows you. He knows you. There'll be a day when he's going to say to people, depart from me, I never knew you. You're not mine. You're not my sheep. And they're going to say, but Lord, Lord, didn't we? Didn't we? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do all these wonderful works in your name? Didn't we? They will declare their knowledge of him, but he will declare his lack of knowledge of them. But those who are truly his, he knows you. So if you name the name of the Lord, Verse 19, let everyone who names the name of the Lord. If you're the one who says Jesus is Lord, just like those people, is your life marked by, here it is, a departure from iniquity, a departure from sin. As servants, if we're going to say, God, you have me, then we need to be people who are departing from sin as well. We say, I'm not going to walk in sin anymore because sin is transgression of God's commands. It is disobedience to God. And so a true, how can we say, God, I'm here to serve you, yet we don't do what he commands? We're not here to serve him at all. So to be usable servants then, our lives need to be not only marked in prayer and in our mindsets with, a, with an understanding that, God, you're worthy and you get to have me. But let me ask you a question. What does he get to have? What iniquity have you let remain in your life and you say, God, use me and all my sin with me? That doesn't go together, does it? That doesn't, it doesn't even fly. Because look what, look what he goes on. He gives you an, an example. To explain. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. Now, let me, let's just describe dishonorable vessels. Our toilets, it's a vessel, isn't it? It's a dishonorable use, 
Okay, that's what he has in mind. Bedpans and, and things of this nature, trash cans and things that were used for trash and disposal, things that get thrown out. Those are dishonorable vessels. But you don't put your trash in your fine china, do you? No, those are for honorable use. We bring those out on special occasions where, where there's going to be honor, where there's going to be exaltation, things of this nature. And so there are vessels of honorable use and vessels for dishonorable use in a great house. Now, which one do you want to be? A vessel that gets thrown out? A vessel that, that you know, is used for trash and, and those kinds of things? No. In this great house are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also vessels of wood and clay. Honorable use and dishonorable use. Therefore, if anyone, look what he says, cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy and useful to the master of the house. Ready for every good work. What does he mean? I, I didn't think I could cleanse myself of sin. What are you saying, Jim? What is, well, what is Paul saying? Because Paul would say you can't cleanse your own sin, can you? No, you can't. You can't atone for your sin. You can't deal with your sin in such a way that puts God's wrath off. You can't do that. But in the sense that we as human beings are living in present tense realities, you still sin. You have you have sinful tendencies in your life. And Paul is saying, as you experience those, you need to put them off. Put them away. Put off that which is dishonorable, which is which he said in verse 19. But everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So what's dishonorable in this text? Iniquity, sin. So as servants, then, we need to be ultra-concerned with sin in our life. Not that we're atoning for that sin, but rather we live in the atonement that Christ has, and we turn from the sin because Christ has atoned us from it, atoned for us, for, atoned for that sin and cleansed us from it. So as we think about presenting our bodies unto Christ as living sacrifices, we need to present to him the vessels for honorable use. So what in your life have you let remain? What in your life have you just kept on? You, 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 it, it's making you unuseful to God. It's making, according to the scripture, it, it puts you in a place where you're really not usable. So to be usable for God, then, we need to, what I spent the last couple of weeks, check our motives, make sure that Jesus gets all the exaltation, because it's only then that he's actually going to get glory. But, but secondly, we need to make sure that we're not walking and living in known sin. We need to cleanse ourselves of what is dishonorable. You say to yourself, well, what is dishonorable? Am I ask Jesus, he'll tell you. He'll reveal it to you. And where else do you find a clear revelation of what's dishonorable? In the scriptures. So it's not mystical. It's very simple. Colossians for a moment. Just to give you an example. Colossians chapter uh, 3. If you've been raised with Christ, verse 1, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above and not on things of the earth, for you've died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So therefore, since you're going to appear with God in glory, therefore, put to death, or the way Paul says in 2 Timothy, cleanse yourself. He's giving you the command, put to death, kill what is earthly in you. And I preached this several weeks ago as well. What is earthly? What is what is what are the things that don't make you useful? Well, sexual morality and impurity. Those are two things that will make you unuseful to God. God doesn't want an impure vessel. Passion, evil passion, strong passions that control you, evil desires, covetousness, or desire for others' stuff. And he calls that idolatry. The wrath of God is coming on these things. Put these things away, he says. You used to walk in these things when you were living in them, but now you must put them away. What else is what else doesn't make us very useful? Anger. Wrath, and malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth, lying to one another. Okay? He just gives you a list of things that, of sins that people deal with on, on a regular basis. That really, when they are a part of your regular, everyday uh, life, or even a, maybe, maybe a sporadic part of your everyday life, 
um, they really make it puts you in a place where God, um, not that He cannot, but He will not use you. So, we want to be vessels of honor, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So, Second Timothy, you're back in Second Timothy, uh, at least I am. <laughs> Chapter two, verse twenty-two. So he said, he gives him a list: flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness. If you want to be usable, a usable servant to Christ, flee youthful passions and pursue. I mean, run after, chase hard righteousness and and, and faith. Chase after love and peace. Go after it with a vigor. That's the word. Pursue. Because that's what those who call on the Lord from a pure heart do. What marks a pure and true believer? How do you know true believers from false believers? Well, false believers, they name Jesus, but there's no pursuit of righteousness. There's no pursuit of love. There's no pursuit of faith and peace. Rather, they, they hold on to youthful lusts, passions. No, one who's called upon the Lord with, from a pure heart, he is pursuing with passion and vigor. He is pursuing righteousness. He wants to be righteous. With everything in him, he wants righteousness. He hungers for it. He thirsts for it. He wants to, a, a strong and steadfast faith in the Lord. He wants a strong love for others and for God. And he wants peace. And that's what those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart do. So he says, Timothy, flee youthful passions and pursue these things because that's what all the people who call upon the Lord from a pure heart do. Verse 24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. If you want to be useful to God, don't be quarrelsome. This verse really, really instructs me. It really, really uh, speaks to me because I'm a debater of this age. I'm Arguer. I like to get my point across firmly and strongly. And I want you to bow to, I mean, you know, not to me, but to my opinion, okay, or my, my way of thinking. And that has kind of always been in my family. We've always been yellers and screamers in my house, and that's what I grew up. So for me, this speaks to me. It may not speak to you like it speaks to me, but it speaks to me because i got to deal with that. I gotta deal with that. You, we, if we want to be useful, we can't be quarrelsome, but we need to be kind to most people. <laughs> What's it say? Verse twenty-four. Everyone. <laughs> Everyone. Yeah. Able to teach. I can do that. One. <coughs> Patiently enduring evil. I don't do that. One. Correcting opponents. I do that with gentleness. I don't do that. <laughs> you see. And God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. We want to be usable. We want to be useful to God. What are we presenting to God? I want you to, as your pastor, to understand that he is worthy. He bought you with a price. Remember what I said before? Him? He has made himself known to you. He has blessed you with knowledge of his son. But do you realize that he's not just blessed you with knowledge? He actually purchased you from sin. He bought you with his blood. He owns you. But the question is, have you submitted to him? That have you said, God, here am I? And if you have, what are you giving to him? The Bible, the Bible, no, you know, we often, not the Bible, but we often say, come as you are. Yes. What we mean by that is, don't come thinking that if you can clean your life up, God will be satisfied. No, come as you are, sin and all, but don't leave as you were. <laughs> don't leave as you were. If when you once walked in them, he talks about this. That's a past tense. We used to walk in that kind of sin. We don't live like that anymore. God deserves better. He deserves everything you've got. But don't serve for status and don't serve for confidence in his love. Serve because he's worthy. But as you serve, give him 
a holy vessel that's useful to him. Okay. What say you? How do you respond to that? Is that a convicting sermon? It convicts me often. I has I'm always hesitant to preach such a message. It's a needed message. But to preach that with grace and kindness and with the cross as central, that's that's challenging because I grew up I grew up in a in a in a culture, a church culture that um, you know, demanded that Jesus get it all. And but we created these false statuses that if we were those self sacrificed like missionaries, people who gave it all and actually went to a foreign field, they were like the highest status in the Christian world. You know. But it almost became a status. It became a pursuit of status within our Christian community. And so, oh, it just so, so mixed with false and true. And it just cultivated. Really, um, someone said this uh, you are what you are with God when no one else knows what you're on, what you do on his behalf. Okay, so what say you? Any, any reactions to that? Any thoughts that might have been sparked? What's been convicting about that sermon to you? Um, what was most helpful? What, what do you wish I would have said? Say it now. Besides, let's eat. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's such a subtle difference between giving your all and giving your all for Jesus. You may not even, on the outside, anybody tell the difference. That's right. And so, without constant visions, being in the Word, the Spirit, the prayer, other believers, uh, I think that you can easily slip in. And the exhortation is just watch it the best you can. You know, and you pray about it and, and, and work really hard. The, the comforting part is God knows you and He knows how to get it out of you too. He knows. But that's where we say, okay, God, do whatever it takes. That's a scary prayer, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> there are times when I said, God, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. <laughs> don't discipline me. Don't, don't deal with it. I know the kinds of stuff you do. <laughs> you put people in whales' mouths and things like that. <laughs> you send stonings and beatings and persecution. That's really impressive around here. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a zigo, but a great fish swallowed me. <laughs> Whale. <laughs> A big catfish. Pastor, you really, I appreciate what you said about wheat fried last week. I have seen a lot about that this week and how it's so subtle in their lives and how we boast in our humility sometimes. Really sneaky, but and then say you talked in the second Corinthians 12 about how Paul was talking about all these things in his life and just like referring it in the third person. Like, I know this man who is doing these things, you know, even it can go both ways. Like, yeah, all these good things that are happening, uh, referring to the third person, not boasting in ourselves, but also for the old self, not like. You talk a lot today about cleansing yourself and how that is the past self, and it's not really you anymore. Like back in the day, it was Saul and then Paul, like, I'm bread, and I, my name didn't change when I believed in the Lord, but you know, that is my old self. That is a different, should be a different person than it is now. It kind of goes both ways with that. I really appreciate that. Is a, a good reminder um, that just all things are from God. That, that any ability or any good thing or service or whatever you might do, that even, even the strength to do such a thing, the ability to do such a thing, is from Him. And so uh, I can't take credit for it. And that means that even if I do something well in service to Him, He gets the glory, He gets the credit, because without Him, I couldn't have done it anyway. Over here. Mm -hmm. 
prayer life changed over? Are you, are you pray, I, I want to know, are you, are you listening to your pastor? Are you praying in accordance with these things? Are you, um, I want you to. I want, I, I, that's, it's a good, good I, I've experienced some blessings of God you know, spiritually when in those times when I say, God, you get me. You got me. It's not like he didn't have me before, but I was acknowledging the mind and spirit you have. God knows he's got you. He knows who it is. And he owns you. But it's one thing to be uh, submissive on your own. Samuel, sometimes uh, when Samuel's getting disciplined by me, I'll, I'll say, Samuel, you're going to obey me. But what I, I always say that in response to, he's not obeying. I say, you're going to obey me. You will. And I, and I, I like it better. Sometimes I'll wake up and the first thing he says, Daddy, I'm your son, your son. I'm going to obey you. <laughs> he himself said, I'm going, whether he does or not, it's a different story. <laughs> but he's at least thinking and submitting to me in that moment, I'll obey you, Daddy. And this, that's what I want from the heart. I don't want, I don't want to have to make him obey. I want a, a child who's going to obey me and do what I ask him to do. And so... Um, Rest assured that if you're his, he will discipline you and bring obedience about. So, why don't you stop that discipline now <laughs> and say, God, God, you own me. But not because you're scared, and, that, and that's, that's why I'm dangerous in the way I'm talking. Not because you're scared of God. Man, God loves you. And anything, any discipline is out of his love. And it's for your good, for his glory. But rather, don't, don't do so much out of fear of what God's going to do to you, but rather, really, what I need to spend a little bit more time preaching is, are the, is the worthiness of Christ. Do you realize how worthy he is? There'll be a day where he shows up in the clouds and he will know his worthiness. But our job right now is we see dimly, we see darkly, so we're asking for clearer revelation of his worthiness, clearer understanding of who he is and how worthy he truly is. Because there's going to be a song in heaven that we'll never get tired of singing. Worthy is the Lamb who is slain. We'll never get tired of singing because he is worthy. The angels don't ever get tired of saying how holy he is because he is altogether holy. He is altogether, as, this, as Solomon said, he's altogether lovely. So I pray that loveliness and that worthiness is what spurs you on. And that's what we did talk about last week is that that's where worship really is. That service is worship. It should flow from a heart of worship. Okay, I love you, and God loves you too. Uh, so go and spend some time with him in prayer. Uh, tell him where you are. He knows where you are, but you acknowledge it. And uh, ask him for grace and mercy. Uh, and ask him for more. Uh, and he will work in you. Let's pray. Father, um, I pray that these words uh, would, would have honored you today. I pray that uh, you would raise up servants for your sake who are humble and seek no glory for themselves but for you alone. So God, work in us. Continue to do that which is necessary for yourself to get glory and honor. In Jesus' name. All right. It is 3.15. Just want to say, just want to say.